Thank you, Bhakti, and thank you everyone for uh, coming here today to hear my talk. Uh, it is based on a book, the chapter that I just wrote. Uh, just give you like an idea how you know this uh, chapter came about. Uh, in 2015, Prudence Lane and Hedy Frontani they asked me, you know, they were thinking about going to the uh, University of Texas Africa conference. Uh, if I would be interested in, in writing you know, an abstract based on the research that I'm doing. Uh, and I became you know, very much interested in writing about the capital city of Eritrea, uh, Asmara. So that's where I'm originally from. It was part of Ethiopia. And at that time, Asmara was being considered uh, to be uh, nominated as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. So I, I have talked to a lot of uh, elders uh, in the community about the city, the narrative of the city, and then the official narrative that was coming uh, at that time. I, I, I became very much interested because my research involves uh, transnational migrants. Uh, my, my PhD research uh, is about Ethiopian and, uh, Ethiopian and Eritrean migrants who come to the U.S. and establish uh, small-scale business. So if you want to understand uh, you know, contemporary uh, migrant communities, you want to understand you know, where they are coming from them, um, in, in that regard, theoretically and methodologically, I think about transnational migrant. So I kind of can give you, um, you know, where, where does my research fit in relation to uh, this paper. So Asmara uh, that you see here is the capital city of contemporary Eritrea. As you know, uh, Eritrea is uh, a country that is located in East Africa. Um, and it, you know, as you can see, uh, you have the Red Sea on the east, in the south, Djibouti, uh, on the west, Sudan. So strategically, uh, it is uh, located uh, in a very important location. So that makes it... Uh, an interesting place locally and also an interesting place uh, globally. Just to uh, give you, uh, you know, uh, why Asmara is important in the contemporary times is because it was recognized by UNESCO as a World Heritage Site uh, in uh, 2017 on July 8th. And what UNESCO recognized was the modern uh, you know, uh, architectural design, because the city is beautiful. Uh, it has incredible um, mo modernist uh, art, 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 art deco that was built during uh, the Italian occupation. So um, my paper, what it does is it starts with, you know, the indigenous narrative uh, of the capital city, uh, which, you know, the, uh, the name of the city was Arbate Asmara, uh, which means the four villages united. So the, uh, the establishment of the city uh, has to do with the importance of creating unity for uh, you know, common defense, for common economic development. So uh, when you see you know, how the city developed or originally ar around the 12th century and 13th century, there were these four uh, villages, uh, Gaza Serensen, Gaza Gotom, Gaza Shilen, and Gaza Asme. So because you know, they were uh, you know, kind of trying to uh, see which one of them you know, controls the territory better, um, so there was a lot of fighting going on. So the oral tradition is that the four uh, uh, you know, villages got united because of women uh, in, in those four villages. They uh, you know, got together and they... Uh, you know, agreed to uh, strategize on how to unite their communities. So the, uh, what they did was they um, made an agreement and then they, uh, you know, refused to, uh, you know, provide food for their husbands, mm -hmm. telling them that unless they unite uh, and become, uh, you know, a common, uh, you know, community, uh, that, you know, their, uh, you know, uh, future is not going to be secured, both because of the internal competition and also because of the external, um, you know, intervention that was coming, there was, 
you know, the um, influence coming from the Middle East, influence coming from Greek, influence coming from Egypt, like all external. So the, the, the way the, the, the local people narrate uh, about the city is uh, for both external intervention and, and then for both, uh, you know, the, the local needs that you have to uh, create, uh, you know, a, a united settlement. So Arbaate Asmara means, Arbaate is in Tigrinya language, uh, means the four. And uh, Asmara, as you can see, A-S-M-E-R-A, -E means in the, in the local language is united. So they, they, the unity is a very important value uh, for the city, for the people. But as we see, um, the way the city was developed, uh, you know, the name Eretra right now uh, uh, kind of got its you know, territorial recognition because it was colonized by Italy from 1890 to 1941. So the creation of the modernist Asmara with A-S-M-A-R, like no, uh, no Arbate, and then the, uh, the nomenclature of the place changes to uh, Asmara. And then uh, the city developed uh, in terms of uh, spatial development uh, differently. So uh, before the coming of the Italians, if you look at the uh, architectural design, it was mostly in you know, hood more, like the people who are in low socioeconomic status, medium socioeconomic status, and people of higher status, they would live in Adarash. So these are built using stones or uh, woods that are you know, found in the, uh, in the local community because Asmara is uh, found in a higher altitude, about 2,000 uh, uh, meters above the sea level. Uh, you, know, the, the, you know, the Red Sea, and then you have Masawa. Uh, let me go back. So if uh, you see uh, you know, the coastal area before the Italians came, the capital city was in Masawa. And then they, uh, the Italians moved the uh, capital city to Asmara because uh, you know, it's better for climatic uh, conditions. It's like the European uh, weather uh, climate, where you know, in Masawa it's very uh, hot. So uh, you know, the architecture uh, of, the, uh, of the city, in terms of special uh, kind of organization, Change it. So, in other words, Asmara was basically spatially divided into four zones. So, you can see in the south, in the southern uh, section, is the Italian zone, and then you have uh, the industrial zone, the market zone, and then the indigenous people uh, lived in this area. So, between 1890 uh, to 1941, the uh, the space that developed very well was a, you know, the, the Italian section. So indigenous people live in a very uh, crowded uh, social space where you know, the uh, facilities in terms of uh, access to water, access to health uh, <coughs> facilities, access to education uh, was uh, you know, limited up to the fourth grade. Uh, you, cannot, you can be smart, but you cannot go up beyond uh, grade four at that time. So in terms of uh, educational development, uh, it was uh, very limited, and especially also the, uh, the European section, as you can see here, um, is a, a very uh, well developed. So this street is called uh, Conquistato. So indigenous people who wanted to visit the, you know, this space, they needed to show uh, permission. So in, in the daytime, they can you know, work here, and then in the evening, they went back uh, to uh, you know, the indigenous or the native zone. Uh, so basically, um, you know, as I saw the, you know, the UNESCO recognizing the, the, the you know, the, the buildings, uh, it made me also think about, you know, as we recognize, you know, these uh, buildings, it also brings back a memory about, you know, the way the native people think about the city and its future. Uh, so, for example, this is a, a famous uh, building, Teatalero. Um, uh, it looks like a plane, uh, and it, it has about 30 feet. <coughs> it was uh, designed to uh, show that, you know, Italy is, you know, taking over Eretra. Uh, basically like kind of uh, an, an area for expanding the Italian territory into Ethiopia. Uh, you know, Italy 
uh, tried to invade Ethiopia twice uh, in you know uh, 1890s, and then they got defeated in the Battle of Adwa, and then from 1935 to 1941, that is a time where the um, you know investment that was done in the capital city, where you saw um, a, a lot of uh, you know architectural innovation. So uh, you know Italian designers. They, they were de designing um, you know, these incredible buildings, but at the same time, they were also incorporating local uh, labor in terms of, so it's you know, both uh, you know, Italian and also uh, indigenous effort that went uh, into the capital city. And then other places, as you can see, uh, cinema in Peru uh, is um, still uh, active. Uh, but it was uh, built in the uh, Italian section of the city. So even the name uh, uh, Empire kind of shows that the, the city was meant for, uh, you know, the kind of Italian, it was a settler colony, in other words. Uh, when people came uh, in uh, the 1890s, uh, at that time there were about 5,000 local people living. But the you know population um, of the Italian settlement increased up to about uh, seventy thousand. So many of the uh, architectural uh, you know uh, designs that uh, UNESCO recognized that they were built between 1930s to 1940s. Uh, and then what happened um, with you know the the local area? As you can see, uh, you know this is the, the market area where uh, you see the, the local aspect uh, you know, of the culture, where you know, basket making, pottery making, uh, is uh, you know, something that is indigenous uh, to the city uh, residents uh, of Asmara. Um, and still the uh, indigenous area, the Abashaul, the Arbat Asmara area, uh, is uh, contemporarily uh, underdeveloped. Uh, when we think about development, I'm asking, you know, what kind of development and who is the beneficiary? Like, how does that how does that change uh, over time? Uh, so, it, 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 uh, obviously, like in the uh, Italian occupation time, uh, economy, uh, politics, and social relationship was basically uh, socially, uh, you know, categorized. Uh, so you, if you were Italian, you had a higher access, uh, mixed, uh, you were in the middle, uh, and then you, if you were the indigenous, you were disadvantaged in, in that system. Um, and then um, during the uh, 1941 to 1952, when Italy uh, was uh, defeated by uh, you know, the Allied forces, they started talking about where does the you know, future of the city of Asmara lies? Should it be part of uh, Italian colony or should it uh, stay under British administration uh, or should it stay with Ethiopia? So there was um, you know, a narrative of uncertainty in the city. So people talk about 1941, 1952 is uh, two ways, like the expansion of uh, education and also the uh, creation of different voices uh, that were happening uh, in the city. Like, where, where is the future uh, of Asmara? Uh, because it, when British came, they, they didn't come with a uh, long-term plan to occupy the city. It was more a kind of a transitionary time for about 10 years. Um, so what happened after that time is Ethio Ethiopia uh, started ruling the city from 1951 to 1991, at that time, uh, in the 1950s, Emperor Haile Selassie was ruling uh, Eritrea and Ethiopia. So at that time, the narrative of the city was Asmara was the birthplace of uh, Menelik, which is the Menelik the first, uh, the son of uh, Queen Sheba, uh, who, you know, uh, went to uh, Jerusalem, met King Solomon, and then. On the way back, when, when she got pregnant, she stopped by in Asmara and she asked for water, Maibala, which means like she asked for water. So this is a place that unites both uh, Ethiopia and Eritrea. So they, not only the unofficial narrative, uh, but also the official narrative 
was you know, Eritrea and Ethiopia before the coming of the Italian colonialism. They were you know, part of the greater uh, Aksumite kingdom. So there, there was a, a, a communality. And you know, culturally, it makes sense because you know, the people of Eritrea and people of Ethiopia, culturally and linguistically, they, they have so much in common, it's very difficult to, to uh, separate them. But you know, the uh, arbitrary nature of, of borders or, or boundaries change and who on depending on who is you know the uh, the official creator of the narrative so when you look at it from that official narrative but that cultural narrative still uh, persists in terms of like how do we create a, a unity among uh, the, the the community of the people but in terms of officially what happened was a, the emperor was overthrown in 1974 by Mengistu Haile Mariam who was inspired by a Marxist revolution. So from 1971 to 1991 was a very difficult time in, in, because it was uh, constant wars uh, that was happening between you know, uh, armored groups who were trying to create the independence of Eritrea and then uh, the Mangustu regime trying to uh, unite the city uh, with Ethiopia. So the, uh, the, the, the it's a long war, bloody war that happened. So the, in terms of the relationship, uh, it was a very difficult time. So to just kind of give you a framework, when I was born in 1974, uh, just the emperor was uh, re uh, replaced by the revolutionary re leader. So my, my own upbringing is I was born as Ethiopian. My national identity said Ethiopian. Eritrea was the 14th province uh, of Ethiopia at that time. So we went to an uh, educational system where we learned Amharic language um, and we had Ethiopian Eritrean friends in the neighbors. But at the same time, in the, you know, outside of the city, uh, there was you know, war going on, depending like whether to create independence or to uh, you know, maintain it with Ethiopia. So in the post-independence uh, time in 1991, uh, the, the uh, EPLF at that time, the Eritrean People Liberation Front, they controlled the capital city Asmara. So at that time, uh, 1991, they said, okay, we, will, we are going to ask the people if they want to be independent or if they want to remain uh, with Ethiopia. So after a uh, two years period in 1993, there was a referendum that happened. And then at that time, the majority of the people, they were, um, you know, tired because of the wars and the, the revolution, because it, you know, it was costing life on both sides. So they decided overwhelmingly to, uh, you know, uh, have Eritrea an independent country. But what happened between 1993 uh, to the contemporary time is a, 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 it's a different narrative that, that is coming in the city, is that, uh, you know, the, the, the development or, or the preservation uh, of the city uh, is, uh, you know, at this contemporary time, the indigenous people say that it's about the elites. And when you ask, like, who are the elites? It's basically the uh, people who came into the city uh, and, and controlled the, the, the territory, and now they basically the, 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 part, the, the ruling party. The, uh, the APLF, which became the uh, PRDF people's uh, 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 let, let me, uh, people's, uh, I don't want to misspell their names because the People's Front for Democracy and Justice, there is no democracy and there is no justice in Eritrea. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the, the irony is that they, they call themselves uh, People's Front for Democracy and Justice, but if you look at the Human Rights Index, Eritrea constantly ranked as the, you know, the law after North Korea, you find Eritrea because there is no uh, private press uh, at the contemporary time. Uh, international press that comes into the country uh, is, you know, monitored. So it's, very, it's, a, it's a closed uh, political system. And what they did was they created a, a national service program. Uh, so in the, the national service program that started uh, in 1995, any young male or female should go to the national service uh, for 
18 months, which is basically uh, you do six months of military training and then uh, you, uh, you do a one-year service. But in practice, what happened is that the, the national service is indefinite uh, because uh, what happened was in 1998 uh, to, to 2000, Eritrea and Ethiopia, they went into war. So the life in the, in the, in the capital city became very difficult for, for people because uh, families were you know, getting disintegrated because of migration. Uh, you know, the reason why people migrate outside of Eritrea is because the, uh, the, the, the political party, the, the ruling regime, uh, doesn't allow elections, it doesn't allow freedom of speech, uh, and people who speak freely, then their human rights gets violated. So the, uh, all the young people, in, in terms of statistics, you see uh, Eritrea represented, uh, it's just five million people, but one of the highest pro producer of refugees uh, and, uh, and uh, immigrants at this time. So, uh, so there is uh, you know, a, a high rate of people fleeing the country, but at the same time, also UNESCO is recognizing the, the buildings, uh, you know, the, the modern, uh, so I'm kind of thinking about you know, the message that, you know, the, uh, the local people tell about the city, uh, you know, narrating that Asmara is about uniting, the, the, the value of the city. Uh, but in terms of uh, officially, whoever was occupying the city um, was kind of passing the formal narrative of the city. And, um, you know, the conclusion uh, of, the, of the chapter is that what lessons can we learn from, from, the, bus, from the past that values, you know, the, the, the dignity of, of people uh, from all uh, backgrounds. So I think this is like a, a broader, uh, you know, uh, outline of, uh, of my paper. But if you have any question or curiosity, instead of me just talking, I would like to give uh, people the opportunity to ask questions, uh, anything that you, you, you have. Yes, Sandy? process of actually getting this thing to a big UNESCO World Heritage Site. Mm -hmm. um, is there a formal kind of submission and procedure going to lead to what happens in charge of that? Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of stakeholders were involved in that and what would you think there are any more? I think the, uh, that's a very good qu question because when, uh, you know, Eretra started um, you know, applying for, uh, you know, the recognition of the uh, UNESCO heritage site. They formed an office uh, called uh, the Cultural Asset and Rehabilitation Project. So what they did was they, uh, you know, documented about uh, 400 buildings uh, that showed, you know, the efforts of both, you know, the Italian and indigenous contribution. So the way they framed it, that even though, you know, these uh, buildings uh, are modernist, they have also, you know, Eritreans worked alongside the Italian engineers. So uh, they emphasize it on the future, that how, you know, the, uh, you know, Asmara can have a value for humanity, not only uh, for, for the city, but also uh, for you know the the larger community. So in terms of tourism, it's good that you know Asmara is getting this recognition because it's going to bring the diaspora. Uh, Eritrea asks you know uh, the diaspora community to pay two percent tax. So in, in that regard, the diaspora community uh, who is also uh, you know building in the city, like some of the uh, modern uh, buildings that you see, like the Sembel complex, locally called in the Korea which means the Korean building. Uh, it's it's uh, pr primarily the new development is for people who are coming from the diaspora or from the ruling party. Uh, so I in that regard, yes, there was a formal process uh, that the government supported and the European Union also funded uh, you know, the, the initiative. So I'm happy that Asmara got the international recognition, but at the same time, also, we can, uh, you know, emphasize about making sure that there is like an opening of, you know, democracy and development that, you know, values the young people. Because if, you know, the young people leave, uh, you know, what is, what is, and, you know, the development? What are, what are we developing?
or what are we recognizing as a world heritage? So I think should that be also part of part of the message that you know should be uh, emphasized to the ruling? Was there a, a debate around this? So we're celebrating 1930 Italian colonialism. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, is there concern raised by indigenous interests? Yeah. The, yeah. That celebrating yeah, right now the local people are saying, uh, you know, what about our human rights? What about our, they are saying about, what about our children? Uh, you know, how do we bring peace? Especially the, the main issue is the, the border issue between Eritrea and Ethiopia. Um, they went into the, um, you know, international court. Decision has been made uh, in 2002 that the two countries need to abide by that. But there is a difference on how to go about it. So from the local people side, it's like we want peace. We want, you know, unity. It means like economic integration, cultural integration. Uh, but, as, but, as the same, but at the same time, uh, you know, they are happy that the city got recognition because, you know, it brings a light to, uh, you know, the, the community. Many people might not know that Eritrea exists even as a country because it was part of Ethiopia. Many, many times, you know, when I'm teaching a class about the African experience or when I'm teaching, you know, my courses, I, I tell them, like, have you heard, uh, my students, have you heard about Ethiopia? Many of them say yes. And then if I ask, have you heard uh, Eritrea? Very few people know because it's a new, a new country created uh, uh, international recognition in 1993. So basically, like, just before South Sudan. Uh, so it's a young, it's a very young country. Um, so the University of Asmara, where I was working, for example, is not functioning right now. Uh, because, you know, when you are in a university, you educate people, you, uh, you know, ask them uh, to also be aware and active uh, participants. And, and, the, and then the ruling elite is basically like they want to control. So I think there was no open space for the local people to, you know, collectively voice their uh, their opinion because it's a military or organized uh, leadership. But in internationally, what they recognized was, you know, the the, uh, the kind of the 1930s, like basically 1890 to 1941, uh, what has been done at that time, not what is happening right now. And you know the reason why Asmara was not, um, you know, affected by all the war, it's uh, you know it's incredible because most of the war happened outside of the city, uh, so 40 kilometers south of the capital city, that that is where the last like my my hometown that was the last place where the war between Eritrea and Ethiopia happened. So the the capital city was not uh, you know uh, affected by like bombing or anything. So it kind of survived miraculously. So in, in terms of recognition, what they are recognizing is that they, these buildings, they have not changed that much. Um, so by, by not changing that much, it means like you are uh, basically recognizing the authenticity uh, of the, you know, the, uh, the heritage uh, that happened uh, at that time. Um, just a couple of things um, in terms of the Italian uh, colonialism and this idea of um, colonialism being very much about reproduction, mm -hmm. not only human reproduction, but the idea of reproduction of the, the settlers of Italian culture, and I say that in the architecture and so forth. Mm -hmm. And um, I wonder if there's a kind of residual in terms of names of streets and things like mm -hmm. that. And my second part is, um, where are these diasporic communities? Are they staying in East Africa, like Kenya, or are they going further afield? Or, or, uh, I'd like to know a little bit more about the diasporic communities. Yeah, that's great, because um, then in terms of naming, you, you find streets that uh, have Italian names, like, uh, you know, Cinema Roma, Cinema Dante, uh, you know, Combistato. And also you have Godena Harinet, which means Liberation Avenue. 
<laughs> so that is, a, you know, the, the local, <clears throat> the local uh, you know, naming of the street exists. And then the, the indigenous people, they keep the old names, like Arba'at Esmera, Abba Shaul, you know, Akhria. They, 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 they keep those names. So uh, in, in terms of names, Asmara is like a, a combination of all this. It's not only one. So, and, and people value that because, you know, when the Italians, uh, you know, lived in Eritrea, they invested, uh, you know, a lot in terms of infrastructural development uh, for, you know, um, you know, for obviously for uh, expansion reasons, but the indigenous people who live there, now they are they are living, uh, you know, in, in those spaces and, and and places, so they value that because it, it was also part of the Ita the Eritrean labor that was going on uh, and the materials that were used. So I I I don't see, um, you know, kind of a only you know negative narrative that comes. It's more mixed, both positive and negative, uh, both positive and negative uh, narrative. So in terms of migration, for example, there are Eritreans who migrate to Italy, um, even though they, uh, you know, the majority of them cannot get you know, citizenship easily. Uh, it's a very difficult process. They come to the US, they come to Canada, Germany. It's all over. Uh, so the people that I study uh, were like people who came both as Ethiopians and Eritreans. Uh, they live in D, you know, DC, the, the majority of them. But you find people living in Seattle, in Chicago. So it's basically like the the uh, the population of Eritrea is about five million, but you have uh, more than one million people who are already left, uh, and they are, uh, you know, in terms of remittances, they are a big part. Uh, so that's why transnational migration becomes important for me. And then within within Africa, within Africa, you have uh, about. Uh, you know, 100,000 or more Eritreans who go to Ethiopia. Uh, there is no, uh, you know, uh, animosity between the people of Eritrea and uh, the people of Ethiopia because both of them suffered in the, in the war time. So Eritreans, they feel comfortable to, you know, go to Ethiopia, ask for refugee status. Uh, Ethiopians uh, also, if, you know, they have problem in their home, they, they can come to Eritrea culturally you know, the, the people are, but politi the, the political leaders depends on who is, you know, ruling. Uh, and then some migrate to Sudan uh, from 1960s until the, until the present time. You have uh, about, uh, you know, um, 100,000 or more, uh, you know, Eritrean Muslims who went to Sudan and they have not gotten a chance to, to, to go back because of the uh, political problems, and then you have also people, especially the young ones, they come to Kenya, uh, you have also Uganda, uh, South Africa, so you name it, like, uh, you know, these this days, like, if you go to Facebook, and you find, like, the young people who grew up with you, and one is in Australia, the other one is uh, in, you know, Kenya, another one is, so it's very uh, spread out. Yes. Um, I was just wondering what kind of documentation there is of the Eritrean history and its political power and its political archives, the enemies that it drew, and what this will mean to indigenous people. Uh, well, there, there, yeah, that's a, a, a great question uh, because you have the, the University of Asmara that was, you know, doing some research. Uh, on the local level, uh, and then contemporarily, the, from the official side, the Asmara Heritage Project, which is a, the, the one that you know up kind of uh, submitted the official desire. But from the in, from the indigenous uh, narrative, uh, I think there is a very limited uh, because uh, you know there are very few anthropologists, um, and you know if you want to. Uh, you know, write about the indigenous narratives. Uh, you need to have like resources. So, kind of in terms of uh, resources, it's a limited. But there is, you know, uh, official collection of the narrative in the Asmara Heritage Project. And yeah, there are some books um, that I can, uh, you know, show you. Like uh, this one, the 
Asmara, Africa's secret uh, modern city. If you want to know more about the pictures and the images, uh, you can find you know, the, the documentation. But I see more work needs to be done on the indigenous aspect. Yeah, uh, music-wise, it's mix. It's mixed. You have the indigenous, um, you know, drum like koboro, krar. Um, but at the same time, when you're walking in the city uh, in Asmara, uh, people drink, um, you know, cappuccino. They listen to music that is global, Italian, uh, American, Arabic. It's because of the of the geographical location. It is mixed, but there is, uh, you know, indi the indigenous that we're talking about, it, even though uh, Eritrea is a small country, about five million, there are about nine cultures. Uh, you know, all of them that they have their own food, their own musical instrument. Uh, so in that regard, uh, you know, there is a festival that happened, uh, a good time to go in Asmara, is in the summer where they do their cultural shows. Uh, where everybody brings their music and I think in that regard, you know, the, there is a space that is given by the official government to encourage, you know, the art and music. So it's, uh, music and art is actually one of the, uh, you know, cultural aspect that is still active, both in, in Ethiopia and in the diaspora. So I think that can be something that we can build on uh, for both the refugee communities uh, as well as for the indigenous people of Eritrea, because that has been uh, promoted positively. Uh, yeah. um, I was thinking about the uh, well, archi architecture and maybe statues and things like that too in, in Asmara, um, you know, during the, the fascist period, uh, mm -hmm. like 1922 to, you know, the, um, well, the 20 years until 1921. Um, did, I don't know if there legacies or issues around that that's kind of part of architectural issues or, uh, you, you know, that, um, you know, you may have stood it in, in Ethiopia in Addis Ababa in front of Baba Gerasi's palace, they were trying to put up a, a statue to uh, fascism, which was a, a circular staircase that every year that Mussolini had been in power, they knew when you know, Haile Selassie returned to power, they kept the, the statue, but just on top of it, put the, the line of freedom, you know. <laughs> so uh, you went up all these stairs, and then Haile Selassie came back to power. Um, but I don't know if there were issues like that or items like that that might refer to that period. Yeah, I mean, there are, you know, some buildings like the current Ministry of Education, where, you know, Mussolini was supposed to give, um, you know, his speech. Um, it, it was the headquarter of the fascist party at that time, but right now is a place where the Ministry of Education is located. So, at that, like the kind of the uh, you know the fascist symbol was removed when the Allied forces got into the capital city. And then, even in the contemporary time, like if uh, uh, you see my my chapter, um, like uh, here, you know where you have the Roma building. And then next to it, they put the national flag. So kind of representing, you know, it was part of the Roman Empire, but now it's part of the Eritrean identity. So the, yeah, the local people uh, include the elements of, you know, the local culture in terms of language and, and symbolism. So there is modification in that regard. And also names, uh, you know, changing the names of the streets. Uh, kind of indigenizing the, the social space. But at the same time, uh, you know, it's, it's not, uh, you know, actively uh, modified. Like the citizens, the citizens have limited agency. Like whatever modification that they do is uh, in, 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 you know, the official spaces very much aligned with the narrative of the, of the ruling regime. But in their homes, uh, inside, they would decorate to the, you know, their own indigenous art. So even in in cafes or, um, uh, or in in streets, you you can see, you know, graffiti's, 
uh, or you know the naming systems that also includes the indigenous aspect. So as that's what makes Asmara interesting is when you when you're traveling in this space, you see the traits of all uh, all you know the past and the present, um, and then that kind of future. Uh, designing even the uh, you know the fiat is a futuristic. So the the narrative of the fi uh, of the city is always looking forward, um, and that 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 future can also include. Uh, I think my, the question that I am asking in my chapter is that future can include also uh, the uh, dignity of all the people in the city. What can we improve, for example, in terms of access to water? Uh, right now, people are talking about uh, drinking water in the city that is accessible in some section of the city, but the the indigenous uh, community they don't have enough water for you know health. Um, you know how can we improve the sanitation of those places? So you know that futuristic uh, you know building means that there are also other aspects that can be built. Um, you know the past is part of the present. I kind of <coughs> Con like connecting those two uh, aspects. So I think uh, all the points that you discussed in um, in terms of um, you know the the places, the uh, conversation that needs to happen also it requires a, a, a political space that allows you know uh, open engagement. Uh, so uh, there is a lot of uh, things that can be done in order to improve. So I think partly is you know when we're talking about democracy. Development is like having elections, um, you know, making the young people have a vision that, you know, this is their home, that they can have a future there, that is that rather than kind of fleeing. So, uh, for example, in migration, there is, uh, you know, an emphasis right now to give whoever is in power more money so that they maintain the status quo, so that the young people will not flee. Um, so the European Union, for example, gave a lot of money for uh, uh, you know, encouraging the government in Eritrea to keep the young people, but in reality, they they use, they are not uh, paid. Uh, you know, they only get paid thirty dollars uh, per month, so they cannot have. Uh, they don't see a future there, so that's why they are fleeing. So I think uh, I'm I'm very much concerned about you know the human right aspect of 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 the development and the democracy. But using this opportunity to. So I think that was the next question I would ask is who else is on the work in um, raising the concerns mm -hmm. about the human rights violations, especially in places or governments or agencies that could bring some light? Mm -hmm. uh, could bring to bear some influence enough to make a change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the in the diaspora, like people are speaking. For example, myself, I mm -hmm. I speak uh, through the publications that I do, uh, and also the, uh, Eritreans are organizing, uh, whether they are in Europe or here in the U.S. Uh, created a radio program. Some of them created radio programs in um, in Europe, in in Paris, that they can the broadcast to Eritrea because you know radio is not available. Like private radio is not available in the country, so TV, private radio, uh, newspaper is controlled by the ruling government. <laughs> so the only option is like the uh, dissenting voices. They they come from outside. So it's mostly from you know Europe, from the U.S., where you have the space to uh, you know create awareness about what is going on uh, in the country. Because when you're recognizing the place as a World Heritage Site, like many people might see that. You know, this is just a perfect place where, you know, everything is going well. Um, and, I mean, in terms of, um, you know, space, uh, you know, the people of Eritrea, they are very um, welcoming people uh, where, you know, people come from the U.S., from Italy. You know, they welcome them, no problem. But at the same time, like, the, they are op the operation is internal. Uh, we don't hear much about it because uh, there is no... You know, private uh, outlet. Uh, so there is a very limited information that that exists outside of that. But I think the future of Asmara, that you know, uh, message of you know uniting yourself because a you know external influence right now. Uh, you know, Eritrea is located in um, 
you know, next to the Middle East. So what is happening in the Middle East also affects. Uh, so I think that, that message, especially if, if you want to keep the young people uh, engaged uh, where they see themselves, you know, in the community, I think that, uh, you know, giving them a space is very important for, for, them, to, uh, for, for them to develop. I, because I, I, I emphasize on that aspect because um, I am an anthropologist, um, kind of giving the voices for the people um, who might not have uh, an opportunity to share it with the broader world. how you're doing this work but in this diaspora and I'm just curious about the opportunities to mm -hmm. create more scholars mm -hmm. in, in Eritrea um, or is it are we at the point where those scholars are kind of being developed in the diaspora and we're going back in you have the benefit of having been there mm -hmm. yeah. and to use that experience <coughs> but as people are fleeing or the, the experience is so kind of depressing in terms of mm -hmm. the ability Yeah, I, I thank you so much for that question because I, I believe in the future of education. Um, you know, Nelson Mandela said, if you want to bring about change in the world, you, you do that through education. Um, and, you know, education for me comes from many ways. The indigenous people, they have a very important thing to teach us. Uh, I value the, uh, you know, oral narratives that people tell about their lived experience that needs to be documented. So one of the work that I was doing when I, t when I was teaching um, in the Department of uh, Sociology and Anthropology at the University of Asmara was training students to, uh, you know, collect those uh, voices that, uh, that are important from the traditional dimension. And then in terms of formal education, we, uh, all of us benefited from the educational system in Eritrea. I finished my undergraduate there. And then I did my master's and PhD at the University of Florida. So I think how do we use education both uh, inside Eritrea and outside of Eritrea so that people can, um, you know, uh, write about uh, all these things and, and tell their stories in, in multiple ways. So that, you know, when uh, we are, you know, recognizing the place as a World Heritage Site, well, we are also recognizing all those stories as equally valuable as well and those experiences as valuable as well. Musa, thank you so well, much. Thank you very much, yeah. Appreciate it.